Well, good afternoon, and uh, I'm glad to see everybody congregating and uh, getting back to in-person kinds of things. So we'll go and get started for the after this session right now. Anyway, we need a. Uh, I know. Is it on or not? It is. Okay. Hi there. Can we go ahead and get started this afternoon? So we uh, we'll go ahead and uh, start the program. All right, thanks, guys. You know, it's wonderful to have everybody in person. So, I, part of this is just um, I'm going to meet a lot of people who preceded me. I have this list of division chiefs that I'll that I hope I'll meet uh, tonight. People, all the emeritus division chiefs. Um, I'm very excited to meet the Odell family as well. I, I, I believe we've contact talked by either email or phone, but but thanks so much. Um, and this is just a, a wonderful celebration. And then I'm so glad that we can do this in person. Um, and uh, thanks so much. We had a wonderful grand rounds today, uh, but Dr. Swerdlock, I was fascinated by um, uh, his remarks. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this afternoon's lectures as well this evening. Um, my name is John Inadomi. Uh, I'm the current uh, department chair of internal medicine. And um, this year we're celebrating our 80th year. Uh, I just realized that it was, the Department of General Medicine was established in 1943. So if you look it up, it's the Oak anniversary. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody knows what that is because who gets to 80, but it signifies loyalty. And you can see the audience. I think this is a good representation of loyalty. So this is a, this is a, a, a great uh, uh, anniversary to celebrate. Um, and so the, 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 um, it's pretty amazing. Since its inception, there have only been eight chairs, including me. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Odell was a department chair from 1980 to, to 1996, uh, built on the strong leadership of the first two chairs, Dr. Wintrow, uh, who founded the department and was a chair for 24 years. And I'll be far gone before 24 years is up for me. Um, and then Dr. Cartwright, who also was a chair for 13 years. Um, and today, of course, our department really uh, uh, thrives uh, on, the, on the shoulders of those giants before us. It really is an amazing uh, journey. And certainly I owe, owe everything to Dr. Odell and the other chairs who built such a great foundation for this department uh, that I was able to inherit. Um, I've uh, read a lot about Dr. Odell. He was really the quintessential triple threat. I mean, they don't make these anymore, right? I mean, triple threat meaning uh, love and excel patient care, uh, uh, really expanded research and focused on, on education. Uh, looking at the department, he really built a really strong infrastructure for academic medicine. It included a really nurturing environment to train the physician scientists. And I think that was one of his um, real hard hall hallmarks, physician scientists and clinicians. Um, you're gonna hear today about uh, the 16 years he served as a chair of the department. Um, he greatly expanded the numbers of faculty, residents, fellows through his support of the educational programs. And again, really enhanced both the research and educational parts uh, of our, our organization. Um, this is uh, evidence today. We have uh, Dr. Odell's legacy continues uh, because we celebrate the William D. Odell Junior Faculty Investigative Award annually. And this was established when Dr. Odell stepped down as department chair and Bill, Margie, and the Odell family created an endowment provides a monetary award uh, for this. And um, I'll, I'll actually, uh, we're able to uh, recognize outstanding faculty. And this is their criteria for this junior faculty investigator award, this is verbatim. An assistant professor who demonstrates honesty, integrity, and maturity in personal interactions with peers, administrators, students, and patients, and who demonstrates potential to become an academic leader in internal medicine. And so, you know, we, we've been able to, uh, in fact, we've gone through the, we just had our um, selection committee processes and a number of uh, uh, qualified applicants is wonderful. And I'm certainly uh, will be pleased with the outcome, uh, which I won't reveal now, but we have an award ceremony. And thanks so much to the Odell family for this wonderful award. Um, today, we're recognizing the tremendous impact Dr. Odell um, had uh, on the, not just the Department of Internal Medicine, but also on male reproductive um, endocrinology research worldwide. Um, and so I'm really um, uh, very uh, thankful to our two speakers, and I'll briefly introduce them today, uh, Dr. John Hoytel and Dr. Ron Swerdloff, who will highlight uh, Dr. Odell's legacy. Dr. Uh, Hoytel served as a chair of the Department of Internal Medicine from 2001 uh, to 2016. I would say his tenure is recognized by incredible, it was a strategic growth, strategic because it really was um, an area where we focused on 
um, several really important areas. Uh, increase in our federal research portfolio, um, really expanding the trainings and residency and fellowship, um, focusing on clinical revenue, which was a new task for department chairs at that time, and at that point, tripling the number of faculty uh, during his tenure. Um, it's, it's boggling to think of how I could ever do, well, I don't want to do that, but if I ever did that, it would be just amazing to, to try to understand that, the magnitude of that, that increase. Um, and I think during uh, Dr. Hoyle's time, really uh, launched us into a more, to be really a modern, uh, uh, really top tier competitive program in academic medicine. And then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Surlov. Uh, we're quite honored uh, to have him uh, as part of our tribute to Dr. Adele. Um, Dr. Swirloff is the Chief of the Division of Endocrinology at Harbor UCLA, an investigator at the Lundquist Institute, and a Professor of Medicine at the Dave Geffen uh, uh, School of Medicine at UCLA. Um, his research spans everything, and I don't know what you don't do. It's basic science, um, it's translational studies, it's clinical trials, um, and your research really involves uh, many aspects of, of, of male reproductive physiology and clinical reproductive investigation. I learned today about your uh, you and 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 um, uh, your uh, your NIH Center grant for male contraception, and it really does again span basic discovery, drug development, clinical trials, and hopefully uh, soon to have FDA approval. So that's quite exciting. And then it was also um, uh, during our conversation, I really fascinated by your epigenomic center. And um, uh, I'm just going to, I'm not sure you're going to talk about this, but certainly during your noontime lecture, talk about how environmental factors uh, impact germline mutations and really understanding how, um, how factors other than DNA uh, can be passed on to future generations. And, and that's kind of mind blowing because this is really a, a, a uh, uh, an idea and a concept and a, a new program research that really does break down prior paradigms of, of heritability. Um, and so with that, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to launch this program. Um, and I, again, a tribute to Dr. Odell and our first speaker today will be uh, Dr. Hoytel. Which um, clicker does he use? Sorry. You got like three clickers, so you don't know which of you use. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming to you. Hear a little bit about Dr. Odell. Um, and before turning the program over to Dr. Ferdinand to provide the interesting aspects of some of the things that Bill did. Um, I'd like to comment on uh, uh, Bill's career and impact at the, at the University of Utah, which was, uh, as you all know, very substantial, and as you just heard. Um, uh, I came about halfway through Bill's tenure here, um, so um, I had a good view from the halfway point on, um, but uh, uh, much of the information I'll share with you today it came from um, former division chiefs and colleagues who were here for most of uh, Bill's tenure. Provide a little more complete picture. As uh, John mentioned, Bill came to the university in 1980, uh, replacing uh, George Cartwright. Uh, this was the last stop on his academic journey. He would serve as chairman, as you heard, for 16 years. And um, as also you heard under his leadership through the department uh, prospered uh, um, in each of the tripartite missions. Just briefly by way of background, um, in something that many of you know, but Bill was a very distinguished academician before he uh, came to Utah. Uh, he received his undergraduate degree at uh, UC Berkeley, completed his medical school at the University of Chicago. Um, <laughs> His residency in endocrine fellowship at the University of Washington received his PhD at George Washington while he was a fellow at the NIH. And then went to California, um, uh, was recruited to Harvard General uh, and developed uh, with, along with others, uh, a research and training program in endocrinology. And then um, eight years prior to coming here, was named the chair of the Department of uh, Medicine at Harvard. Uh, so that you note that by the time he came to Utah, he had considerable leadership experience and program uh, building experience. 
Um, Bill was an outstanding catch uh, for Utah. Um, John mentioned the triple threat in academic medicine, which uh, may be a dinosaur, but uh, was certainly uh, uh, emphasized at that time. Um, and I would kind of posit that Bill wasn't a triple threat, he was a quadruple threat. And you might even argue that he was a quintuple threat. We'll talk about that through the presentation. He was a superb scientist, an outstanding clinician, a gifted teacher and mentor, uh, and a visionary leader and administrator, and for many of us, a uh, dear friend. He was widely appreciated for his remarkable range of abilities and accomplishments. Um, and I think it was his broad-based excellence that Bill had that really made him so successful as a chairman and so effective. Um, and I'll kind of briefly com comment on each one of these aspects of his uh, uh, quadruple uh, threat uh, as they pertain to the Department of Medicine here and how they impact the Department of Medicine here. Um, so Bill is a scientist. Uh, Bill and his colleagues, uh, as you heard this morning, developed novel diagnostic approaches to assessing uh, endocrine disorders and we'll hear more about that in just a minute. And investigated ectopic uh, hormone production by tumors. Um, suffice it to say that Bill contributed his scholarly work, uh, continued to contribute his scholarly work while coming to Utah with uh, ongoing extramural funding and publications throughout his chairmanship. Uh, Bill even managed, uh, this is Bill, an on-site sabbatical that he took for a year, uh, where I, I don't know exactly how much time he spent in the department, but I know he got, he really enjoyed his sabbatical. Um, Thursdays were his designated lab day. He maintained that level of commitment throughout his career. Um, and this was a time that was very special to Bill. Uh, Bill was, in my, Mind many others, the consummate scientist, always uh, encouraging inquiry and research. He had great ideas and could helpfully express and discuss most of the aspects of investigation. He was a great collaborator, and over the course of his uh, career, trained uh, some more than uh, fifty postdoctoral fellows uh, and published uh, very extensively. Um, Bill as a clinician. Uh, Barry Stoltz and Randy Hurt uh, both noted that despite the demands running a large department, he was truly an outstanding clinician. Barry uh, noted that Bill's impressive clinical skills were perhaps somewhat underappreciated, um, but they weren't underappreciated by those who worked with him. The residents in the endocrinology service or in morning report were uh, strongly impacted by his clinical acumen and skills. Um, Bill's input is, uh, was solicited by uh, on the most difficult cases in endocrinology by the endocrinology faculty members throughout his tenure here. And Bill remained clinically active uh, throughout his tenure at Utah uh, and provided me a great role model uh, for other academicians. Uh, Bill is a teacher and mentor. Uh, it goes without saying, I think we've heard that Bill inspired many colleagues, residents, and students for boundless energy, his intellectual curiosity, and commitment. Uh, as discovered by the residents lucky enough to rotate with Bill, he was a terrific teacher. Uh, despite his administrative load, he continued to teach endocrinology to first-year medical students throughout his career. Moreover, uh, Bill took special interest in health staff participating in the in the interview process, uh, leading the ranking meeting, and helping uh, match uh, those few unmatched students from Utah and other places, and desirable places. Um, Bill was also a very strong advocate for uh, his residents. Uh, just to provide uh, one example, Will Deere and Gil Welch, both former residents here, uh, commented on how Bill went to bat for them when other residents uh, and, and other residents when they were initially denied entry into the fellowship programs of their choice. Um, Bill got on the phone, changed that uh, fairly quickly uh, with his intervention, and his support uh, changed their careers. Um, 
Will, after a very successful career in pharmaceutical industry, served as associate VP for research at the Health Science Center here until he recently uh, stepped on uh, retiring. And Gil um, is a uh, currently a faculty member in public health at Brigham and Women's and uh, a very successful and widely cited investigator on the quality of medical care. Uh, and both of those uh, people uh, would not be aware to attain what they attained, most likely without Bill's active intervention. Uh, I think most importantly uh, for today's discussion, Bill was a visionary leader and administrator. Jay Mason noted that Bill came to Utah with, uh, with big ideas and really was able to execute on uh, many of those ideas. He came at a time when division chiefs were nearing retirement. Uh, there uh, had been a gradual overall decline in both research and clinical productivity in a fairly narrow research, the research focus is kind of narrowed down. Um, department finances were in a tough spot at that time, more so than they had been. And through his insights and activities, his support of uh, enhanced research and training programs and uh, strength in, and strength and collaborative um, partnerships, Bill remedied these problems uh, in a relatively short period of time resulting in uh, really large increases in faculty, uh, fellowships, the residents and the fellows. Uh, Jay thinks that Bill got a really good package when he came here. Um, new division chiefs were recruited for each division during Bill's tenure. Bill started new programs and divisions. This is one example, gerontology with Jerry Rothstein as chief. And when appropriate, I saw John Zone here, um, supported divisions becoming their own departments with the initial, uh, John Zone being the initial chair. Uh, Bill was incredibly supportive of his chiefs. I think one of, one of the real um, important aspects of how he handled things is he, um, he provided the chiefs with a great deal of latitude um, as to how the divisions would develop. And I think that really served to, to kind of stimulate uh, the division chiefs and, and help in building uh, the various divisions. Bill also recognized the value of strategic partnerships, just as one example. Chuck Smith points out uh, the uniqueness of the University VA partnerships under Bill. Bill valued the VA in teaching students, health staff, and supporting research. He was the first chair to have a division chief based at the VA. Um, he supported Jerry Rossi in developing the VA Center of Excellence in Geriatric Medicine. He supported John Hibbs, who was the division chief, uh, but was mainly uh, active at the VA, uh, so much so that he, John was awarded the outstanding researcher in the entire VA system during Bill's tenure um, and Bill's leadership. Uh, one only needs to look at the excellence today of Matt Seymour's current VA-based epidemiology uh, to appreciate how Bill's emphasis on partnering with the VA was greatly strengthened, um, has greatly strengthened the Department of Medicine and its uh, overall mission. Um, Barry Stoltz provided another, I think, important example of uh, Bill's astute leadership in building the department. Shortly after arriving at Utah, Bill recognized that academic researchers, whether by interest, skill level, or available time, were frequently not able to meet the teaching and clinical care responsibilities of a modern department of medicine. And despite a lot of pushback and contrary advice from many senior faculty members, three years after arriving here, Bill um, pushed through a new clinician educator track in the department. Uh, this track uh, was to be judged uh, and rewarded not on grants and publications, but instead on the quality and the quantity of teaching and clinical care. This was a new approach in academic medicine. Bill actually received considerable recognition for this when he published uh, this in, the, in 1986 in the Journal of Medical Education. Uh, Bill went out of his way uh, throughout his time as chairman to make sure that members of this track 
knew they were much uh, valued uh, for their contributions. Uh, as we look back today, um, it's quite clear that without the development of this track, we would not uh, have seen the tremendous growth in clinical activity that has occurred. Uh, and the new health, as they call it, uh, would not be nearly what it is today if it even existed. Uh, overall, Bill improved the research and clinical care capabilities throughout the department so substantially that under his leadership, he became a top tier uh, Department of Medicine. Um, Bill's accomplishments as a leader and investigator were widely uh, recognized. Bill was recipient of the Robert H. Williams MD Distinguished Leadership Award from the Immigrant Society. He was also presented the Albert Nelson Marquis Lifetime Achievement Award by Hu Tzu and received the Mayo Soli Award from the Western Society of Clinical uh, Research, which honors uh, lifetime achievement in outstanding medical research and training junior investigators, which is a big part of what Bill did. Uh, what made Bill so successful and so special? Uh, much of Bill's success, I believe, can be related to his personal qualities um, already mentioned and, uh, in, and that included his boundless energy, his unflagging enthusiasm, his indestructible optimism. He was an open, fair, honest uh, person and had an infectious enthusiasm for his job. He was able to see and build on the strengths of the faculty. He was a role model as an academic physician and leader and an inspiration to all. Importantly, I think uh, Bill was a friend to many with whom he worked. So I hope this kind of brief review provides a perspective of Bill's impact on the um, uh, University of Utah. He was an outstanding scientist, a superb clinician, excellent mentor and teacher, gifted leader, uh, inspiration to all, and a friend. Um, <laughs> Bill, um, he played a critical role by building an important foundation in the Department of Internal Medicine. We are very grateful to you both you and Margie for your amazing uh, generosity to the department and for making so many of us feel so welcome when we arrived at the University of Utah. Today is just one small way for us to pay tribute to both of you. Uh, today we say thank you, thank you, you had a marvelous life. I would like to close with this picture. This is Bill as we uh, know him. This is Bill with that unforgettable smile. Uh, and this is and this is Bill who we will all miss. Thank you. John, thank you so much. It was just a wonderful tribute and I learned a lot. Um, Right now, again, I've, I've, I've introduced Dr. Swerdloff, who had, a, again, a wonderful uh, noontime lecture, and um, invited him to come up and talk a little bit about a, his own tribute to Dr. Odell. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, this, one, this one works this time. So. This one works. <laughs> OK. Uh, well, I want to start off by saying what an honor and a pleasure it is to be here. I got a chance to see Tim and Debbie that uh, I hadn't seen in many years and then met for the first time uh, some of the grandchildren that uh, they had. And what a wonderful, wonderful couple. So um, let's see how this thing drives. So uh, earlier in the day, uh, I spoke uh, at Grand Rounds and I showed this slide uh, about the qualities of Bill O'Dell. Uh, some years before, he had the opportunity to come here to the University of Utah and to lead uh, the Department of Medicine in this institution. And what was just described about the qualities that made him so special uh, were not surprisingly 
the same qualities that made him special for his entire life. Uh, he was a caring and thoughtful physician, as was described. But most of all, Bill had something really special. He had charisma. He was one of those people that you, once you met him, you never forgot him. He was just a very incredibly infectious person. I first met Bill in 1966, and he was at the NIH. He was a real superstar at the Cancer Institute. And I happened to be a young um, yellow beret, as they described us, uh, at the Aging Institute. And he came and gave a talk, and we talked, and I, I thought, wow, this guy's really something. So I had a year after finishing up the NIH, I had a year to take uh, further residency training, and I went to UCLA. And I was going to go back to the NIH, and I uh, thought I would stop in and talk to Bill because he had come to uh, the public hospital, Harbor General Hospital. And I thought I would come down and, you know, just kind of talk to him. So as I mentioned, I think this morning, after 30 minutes talking to Bill, he had convinced me that I should not go back to the NIH. I should stay and uh, work with him. And he said, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll arrange that you take an extra two years of training and you're gonna become a reproductive endocrinologist and it'll work out fine. And I said, Jim, this sounds pretty good. And I knew that he had developed all these tools, which I will mention, that made reproductive endocrinology sort of a real opportunity. Uh, so I did, and uh, he said, oh, by the way, we're going to write a grant. And I said, what do you mean we're going to write a grant? And he says, yeah, uh, you need a grant. So he said, let's sit down and we'll talk about it. We'll write a grant. At the end of the day, we wrote a grant. I mean, it took a little bit of fine tuning, but not an awful lot because he was so smart. And so uh, got funded. Uh, those were the magical, that's what I call the magical years in, in endocrinology and medicine. So Bill had this incredible intelligence, dedication. He was incurious. Every single thing he would, he taught me that when you walk along the street, take a look at the trees and the mountains and things like this and look at the billboards and wonder how they were created and why they were created and what they meant. And, and I thought that was really very special. And he was very industrious. He also taught me something that, I, you know, I kind of watched everything he did because he was such a hero. And so he taught me that when you go to meetings, he said, notice what I do. And I said, okay. So after every talk that anybody gave, Bill would stand up and say, I'm Bill O'Dell. And I have like just a few questions I want to ask. And of course, they were piercing and, and right on the point questions. And so, oh, gee, that's a skill that I ought to learn. And I kind of followed it and, and, um, and uh, asked a lot of questions too. So uh, this was sort of the way uh, he was and so supportive of the colleagues uh, and trainings. So this is, uh, I showed this picture this morning at Grand Rounds. Uh, this was a picture of Bill, uh, I think in the early days when I first uh, uh, got to know him and worked for him and with him. Uh, and again, you can see the same smile that was referred to uh, earlier. So a little bit of background uh, for Bill O'Dell. Um, this is Robert Williams, and anybody in uh, endocrinology knows that Robert Williams wrote a book on endocrinology, and he was the chairman of medicine at the University of Washington uh, at the time when Bill was a resident. And it turns out that uh, a lot of the qualities that, that Bill O'Dell had 
Um, he must have learned some of those from Bob Williams. So he was also Bob Williams' favorite resident. And it turns out that after Bill left and he came to Harvard, and for reasons that are totally unclear to me, Bob Williams would give me a call every once in a while. And he says, you know, he says, I, you, it's a great place there at Harvard, but I think that Bill ought to be a chairman. And, you know, here I was, this young kid, and, you know, I didn't influence Bill O'Dell, but, but Bob Williams thought that maybe I could get this idea into him. And so maybe in some small way, uh, I played a little role in the vehicle that Bob Williams wanted to get him here at the University of Utah. So uh, I could talk forever about Bob Williams, but I won't. So Bill was, uh, when I first met him, as I said, he was at the NIH. And these are some of the special people that he worked with. So Mort Lipset um, was said in this era to be the best known endocrinologist in the world. Uh, and Mort was really quite a very special person. And he uh, became president of the Endocrine Society. And on the far right, you can see a picture of Griff Ross, who also became a president of the Endocrine Society. And Griff Ross was Bill O'Dell's very, very close friend. And Griff Ross was a really special person, as I explained to John earlier, uh, that Griff Ross uh, was a Texas primary care doctor who, for some reason, decided that he wanted to be a scientist. So he went to the Mayo Clinic and got a PhD and ended up at the NIH. And he was sort of a mentor uh, for, Bill, for Bill O'Dell. And Griff Ross was really a remarkable person. Griff Ross was the kind of person who could read your manuscript as you submitted it for publication, turn it down, get on the phone, call you up, tell you why he turned the thing down and what you should do to make a really good quality thing. So I think that Griff must have had an influence also on Bill O'Dell and they were close for many, many years. A couple of the other people at the NIH are shown below. Uh, Wayne Barden uh, went on to a fantastic career uh, and uh, he went on to, uh, to uh, Penn State. Uh, and after leaving the NIH and then to the Population Council where he uh, developed a lot of important drugs and was a really amazing and a good friend for many years. Recently passed away and Christina and my wife was here uh, with me uh, and I, uh, when we were in New York City, we would often get invited to his house. And Griff Ross explained to me early in this that the world consisted of a small number of people, and you know all of them. And what he meant was that we knew all of these people that Bill O'Dell had introduced us to. On the far right corner is Stan Kornman, and Stan was uh, came with Bill to the Harbor General Hospital from the NIH, and he was one of the really early people who was working on estrogen receptors in breast cancer. And really super smart uh, guy. Uh, and he's still at UCLA. And uh, we know him uh, very, very um, well. So this was a, a group of people at the National Cancer Institute. And for reasons that aren't totally clear to me, that the National Cancer Institute was focusing on, uh, on issues of hormones in cancer and how you could treat various types of cancers with hormone in sort of an enigmatic way. And uh, they were really super, uh, this was a super group of, of people. So uh, I just wanted to make a few points that I thought were interesting because when I was thinking about what I was gonna say, it caused me to think about this magical era and the NIH. And Bill came to the NIH and I had a chance to come to the NIH, which is just another story which I could tell you uh, in a social hour. But, the, um, but it turns out that the NIH was really the place where so many people 
decided to go from being a practicing physician to a physician investigator. And, and they had this system called the ATP, which meant during the Vietnam War, you had your choice. You could end up going to, um, to be a surgeon type of person in the war, or you could go to the NIH or go to the US Public Health Service hospitals and get your, your training. And it turns out that that um, I didn't realize this at the time, but that you had approximately 1.5 times as likely to be um, to become a full professor if you had spent this two years at the NIH, and twice as likely to become a chair of a department, and three times as likely to become a dean. So this was sort of a, a, a fertile ground for people. I know when I first went, I probably would have been a good clinician and probably would have done good things. And I'm sure I would have done my very best to be, uh, to be great to all my patients. But I sort of learned about, about science and part of medicine and, uh, and changed my direction. And they were also, the associates uh, were also likely to hold or fellows to hold positions in top-ranked medical schools, to fill leadership roles at the NIH or win prestigious awards or honorary um, memberships. So when Bill was at the NIH, he developed a large number of assets. For, uh, part of this was the environment, part of it was his curiosity, Part of it was his skill, and I'll talk a bit about the uh, about Bears in Yellow in a minute. But the number uh, of papers that he produced with assays that he created were really remarkable, and they covered such a broad ground of endocrine purposes, and they had set the groundwork for the next 20 or 30 years of hormone studies in so many different uh, areas. And I'm just flashing these up, not that you uh, need to read all these, but they weren't just in the reproductive field, they were in many, many fields. And they weren't just in male reproductive things. I mean, we, we managed to, to study the reproductive cycle in women, measure all the hormones, decide how what stimulated the mid-cycle peak in ovulation. And, and he did all this in a very few years uh, at the NIH and then subsequently at Harvard Hospital. So in 1966 or early 1967, Bill was recruited from the National Institute of Health to head the adult endocrinology and the combined adult and pediatric endocrine division at Harvard UCLA, which was then known as Harvard General Hospital. And it was a former military hospital um, where the, um, the soldiers who came back from the Pacific Theater got, were, uh, were seen and treated if they were ill. And it was, uh, it was a big bunch of barracks uh, that hadn't been changed. And when Bill came there, and also when I came there, there was all these, these barracks and we did our research in uh, in these barracks, not at all like these grand rooms that we're looking at here. I mean, they were barracks. Uh, and we would remodel them a little bit, but that's the way it was. So um, so he um, then recruited, as I'll show you in another slide, uh, Del Fisher, who also became the president of the Endocrine Society. This was a remarkable group of, of people. Uh, and. Then one day there was a fellow by the name of Al Nichols who came and showed up and he knew Bill O'Dell also. And he said, you know, I wanna have a different concept of a research laboratory, uh, but be a commercial one. And so we talked and we talked and, 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 um, and so Bill convinced him to, that yeah, we're glad to talk to you and your ideas and all these types of things and sure we'll help you. But, uh, you can run our clinics for us. So he became a volunteer who ran the clinics. You know, again, Bill could convince anybody, anybody. <laughs> so then, um, of course, we had all kinds of special guests. Everybody wanted to come and see Bill. Um, you know, and he and Rosalind Yallo, who you, I'm sure, 
No, won the Nobel Prize, and we'll show pictures of Yellow in person in a moment. Uh, hosted the first Endocrine Society radio amino assay workshop in 1971, and the people from all over the country were came there to go work in the laboratory and to uh, see how you do these assay type of procedures. Uh, so it was pretty pretty special. You're getting the picture that here I was, and and I finished my two years of training and uh, did a few other things. That, uh, but it was really remarkable. <clears throat> so then a little bit of work of idea of how everything happened in Harvard General. There were two people. Sherman Mellenkopf was the first dean of the UCLA School of Medicine. Harbor Hospital was the first hospital of the UCLA School of Medicine before they built the medical center. Um, they had the students there. Uh, in their first two years, but they didn't have a hospital, so the public hospital was the place where people trained. And sure, Mellenkopf was a dean for a long period of time. You know now deans have, uh, I don't know, 14 or 15 assistants, you know, associate deans and all kinds of different people. Sure, Mellenkopf with one person ran the entire medical school. He also was my attending physician when I was a resident and was a remarkable guy, a wonderful clinician. And you know, you took your rotation with him and he'd say, hey, you want to go to the basketball game? Here's the basketball tickets and things of that sort. Really terrific. So uh, Sherman Mellenkopf said that Harbor Hospital was the um, crown, was the jewel in his crown. And he recruited a guy by the name of David Solomon, who was an endocrinologist. And David Solomon was a wonderful, wonderful, warm person. I'm going to say a little bit more about David in a moment. So um, Harbor Hospital, interesting enough, very, very strange, became one of the most sought after training programs in medicine in the United States. You have to understand this was a public hospital that only the year before or two years that they had full-time staff. And suddenly, magically, with this Sherman Mellenkopf's idea, David Solomon's judgment. Uh, David started to recruit people because because Sherman Mellenkopf gave him money to be able to recruit a group of young superstars. So I asked David Solomon later, "How did all this happen? How did you get all these trainees from from Harvard? We had the one year we had eighty percent of the people who got." Uh, residencies at our institution, interns and residencies were in the top 10 people at the Harvard School of Medicine. And it was really crazy. He says it was easy. He said, I recruited Bill O'Dell and the rest followed. And that was the magic that this guy had. He was, he had this capability of convincing people that this was going to be a special place. So in 1972, David Solomon became the executive chair of the UCLA School of Medicine, and Bill O'Dell became the chairman at Harvard General. And it was very, very strange again. I was given the opportunity to step into Bill's shoes as the endocrine chief in 1973. Now, I was surrounded by people that I admired so much. They were senior to me. They were really capable super scientist, wonderful clinician. Uh, and I have no idea why they decided to let me to try to fill Bill's shoes, which I certainly I never did, but I did try my best for the next 50 years. <laughs> so uh, this was a few of the early leaders. I spoke to you on the, le uh, the far left is Bill Fisher, who um, became president of the Endocrine Society and arguably was the finest pediatric endocrinologist uh, in the country uh, at that time. Uh, and we ran a joint program where we all did uh, adult and pediatric endocrinology. Uh, to the left, it, oh, sorry, got too excited, uh, is uh, Dick Classic. And Dick Classic uh, was one of the early recruits. Uh, Dick Classic is a nephrologist, uh, wrote the textbook on nephrology, and all the nephrologists know who Dick Classic is 
a wonderful superstar of a guy. Uh, and I uh, went on to be chairman of the University of Kentucky. And then uh, he's back in Los Angeles and uh, he gave a lecture just the other day and he's 90 years old and it sounded just as, as clear and crisp as it was when he first came. Villadell also recruited George Bray, which is seen uh, in the uh, left-hand uh, corner over uh, here at the bottom. And George Bray, uh, was really a remarkable person. He sort of was the master of obesity, diabetes, an incredibly bright guy, went on to uh, form an institute uh, or work on the institute. Here's the informant. Mike Crowley um, was recruited uh, as the head of cardiology from Johns Hopkins. And he developed the emergency program in Los Angeles and actually was the advisor for the television show that went on for, for many years. So you can see the skill that Bill had in selecting uh, people like that. So these were some of the early mentees of uh, Bill O'Dell and Del Fisher. Andrew Chopra is shown on the left hand. Uh, corner. He developed the assays for T4 and T3 uh, uh, for uh, thyroid disease. Uh, in the right-hand corner was Mark Sperling, who wrote the textbook on pediatric uh, endocrinology after Wilkins uh, did, uh, and um, went on to head his department in, in Pittsburgh and Cincinnati. A couple of people from the many, many people that Bill trained uh, was Mark Mullich uh, on the lower part. He went on to Northwestern, a world's expert on a lot of different things. Um, and then in the right-hand corner was John Marshall, who, um, who went on to do work on polycystic ovarian disease in Michigan and then the chairman of medicine at the University of Virginia. So Bill, at one time, I think he had 20 fellows and really incredible things. So they were all over everywhere. And so uh, one of the wonderful things is that uh, Bill was very good at sharing people, uh, whether or not he, he, he would meet with people and tell them what they ought to do and how to work on and this and that. Uh, but uh, so there was a couple people my first year on the faculty that he decided to share with me. One is a fellow by the name of Patrick Walsh and Patrick Walsh went on to be the, um, the chairman of neurology at Johns Hopkins and the head of the Brady Institute and arguably the best known neurologist in the country. So Pat was a resident, so he sort of got assigned to me and we, uh, we did a lot of work together and we've been friends uh, uh, ever, ever since. And um, this was just the way Bill would do. He would let other people have a chance to take the people that came to see him, meet him, and share them with others. On the far, on the right here is just another example of a person, Howard, uh, Howard uh, Jacobs, who is a PCOD person, uh, went on to be uh, at Middlesex and the University College in London, and was one of the world's experts in this. And, when he retired, I've gotten to be the place where I, I end up going to, to give talks at, at people's retirements and unfortunately too many memorials. So you get the idea of the generosity of this, uh, of this man. So it wasn't just the trainees who were all over the place uh, and, the, uh, and the people that would come from the NIH, but also, there was many Nobel laureates that came to these barracks where we were doing this, this work. And Saul Bearson and Oz Yalo, I remember so very well when they came. Um, they had, of course, in, 1950, in 1959, developed the radio amino acid for, for growth hormone. And, and, um, and Oz Yalo uh, won the Nobel Prize for that after uh, Saul Bearson passed away. And, it was really unfortunate that, that he didn't get equal credit and he was just a super bright, terribly bright guy. The two people on the right visited uh, not infrequently, Roger Gehman uh, and uh, Andrew Shelley, who were 
to people from uh, elsewhere that uh, happened to be working in Texas and uh, and purified GNRH that I talked about this morning in the, in the lecture. And these are the kind of people that were showing up week after week and month after month at Harvard General Hospital just to come and, and schmooze with, uh, with Bill Adele. So this is a picture um, of uh, some of Bill's uh, trainees. Um, I think you can see Bill uh, there with Margie. Uh, and it was at the Anderson Society. Del Fisher is next to Margie. And then uh, I'm, uh, I'm a little heavier in those days. The only contest that I ever won with Bill O'Dell was if he said that he wanted us to have a contest on going on a diet. So I lost about 35 pounds and I won that contest, but that was the best I could ever do in the contest with Bill Adele. So I mentioned to you that Dean Mellencoff loved and admired the faculty. Harbor was the jewel in his crown. David Solomon was a gifted recruiter and a warm person. He was like a father to all of us. And Bill, of course, was admired by Everyone, his army of trainees and research opportunities for uh, for everybody, and the senior members treated the trainees with inclusion, and we were as much a family as a team. And the remarkable thing, I just didn't realize it, you know, because because here I was, I don't know, twenty nine or twenty eight or something like that, and. These guys who I thought were the super superstars, they're only eight years older than I was. And they, yet they seem so mature and so, so established. Uh, so this, they were really a, a, a young group of superstars. So as I said, Bill always introduced his trainees to the giants in medicine. Uh, I became friends as a young professional with everybody's uh, heroes. And I traveled with Bill and Margie to Mexico. Mort Lipset, who was the head of NCI, and Bill Dowaday, who some of you may know was a superstar uh, endocrinologist. We went to Papua New Guinea for two weeks with the headhunters and the things of that sort. Went, took canoes down the Pacific River. And uh, it was just a different type of environment. And then Bill took me to the Laurentian Hormone Conference where we presented papers and I discussed science with leaders in medicine. And this was the, the type of environment that existed. And of course, Bill and Margie entertained us at their home on the hill uh, with, with the uh, five children that we mentioned before. And I learned from Bill and Margie how to be a gracious host. And the ritual of the evening was playing Bill and table con tennis. And of course, he always won. <laughs> so uh, we played bridge once a month at the senior's house. And this was the type of, of period of time when people were close and worked together and played together. And it was really quite, quite special. He also supported the careers of Harbor UCLA. Um, this happens to be a picture of of uh, a group of people. There happens to be Bill there, um, George Bray, Kevin Catt, um, and uh, Gene Wilson, a president of the Anderson Society, Stan Corman, Dave Solomon. And we were there because I was uh, inducted into the um, American Association of uh, Physicians. And you can see I was younger at that time. So, um, Bill and Margie moved to Salt Lake City in 1980, as you've heard, uh, just like uh, Robert Wayden predicted and insisted on, uh, and the rest of the history uh, belongs to all of you. And uh, thank you very, very much for letting me come here and uh, talk about the people that I love so much and who had such a tremendous impact on my, um, on my career. And here's a picture of uh, Margie and, and Bill, a list of the, uh, of the five children. I'm sorry, I don't have the list of all the grandchildren, but Bill and Margie would talk about them frequently and they were so proud of all of you. So this was, uh, this was uh, just a special chance for me. I feel very privileged to be here. So that's it. Thank you.
Well, thank you. That's um, what a wonderful tribute. Um, I, again, I learned so much. Uh, there's such a rich history here. Um, and also the history of our leaders who came and the, uh, how they got here was always fascinating as well. Um, you, you talk about how what a small world it is. And it's, it's less than, you know, they, it's less than the six degrees of freedom. I see like two degrees here. We're all somehow related. So it's pretty, pretty incredible. Um, this is like basically the end of the, this part of the, of the program. Um, I, if, if any, um, I think at this point it's kind of more of a, a socializing, but also if anybody has any other comments to make, we're happy to, to date them. I, I'd love to, to uh, I'm going to be interested in meeting the rest of the Dell family. So thank you so much for attending and for, um, for offering all the, first of all, uh, the, just the legacy of Bill is so wonderful. Um, we're going to be having a dinner this evening. Looking forward to meeting everybody there. Um, but I think that's about it that we have. I'm looking at other people in the audience to see if there's anything else going on. But um, if not, we'll, we'll be just go ahead and start socializing because I think there's uh, time for a few drinks and a few things to eat. But uh, again, uh, thanks so much, Dr. Swerdloff. And it was a wonderful uh, to, to, uh, to hear about uh, you know, the, the history of Bill prior to coming. Uh, and um, you're just uh, really fantastic. And thanks so much, John, for your uh, uh, summary of, of Bill's accomplishments here as a department chair. I got a lot to live up to. So <laughs> again, one of those things we're um, looking forward to trying at least. Thank you very much. Yeah.